It was the most cosmopolitan city in the world. It was also the most corrupt city as far as moral and vice. It, it, uh, Greece has got a north and a south area, northern Greece, southern Greece, and there is an isthmus that goes between the, the lower level of Greece and the upper level of Greece, and this isthmus it connects these two. An isthmus is a body of, of land surrounded on both sides by water, connecting two pieces of land. So there was water to the east of this, and there was water to the west of, of this isthmus. This was the isthmus we call the isthmus of Corinth. The city of Corinth was there. It was, it, was on, uh, it, was, it was basically on the east side and the west side. And what happens is, it's kind of like what was like before they built the Panama Canal. Whenever you had a ship leaving New York to go to San Francisco in the 1800s, it had to go all the way down around the bottom part of, 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 of South America, near, near the, uh, the uh, Antarctic area, and come all the way up. And then when uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, ended up uh, building the Panama Canal, uh, it made travel time half that. Because you can go through the air and go through the locks of the canal and go right into the Pacific Ocean back and forth. The Isthmus of Greece was kind of like that. It was Greece and, and you know, the Roman Empire's Panama Canal. Basically, they didn't have a canal driven through there, but what they did, they put a corduroy road on there. A corduroy road is walls that are laid in the ground and, they, and, and they've been greased. So if they roll and they're going to go from time to time and they would grease these logs. And what they do, a ship would come into port and they would hook that ship, uh, pull that ship up onto a cart, kind of like thing, on that, on that corduroy road. And they would have the oxen, the animals, and, and even slaves, and they would push that boat up over the top of this isthmus down to the other side. If it was going to Rome or Spain, they would go from the east and cross over. If it was going from Rome back to, say, Assyria, it would do that way. They would go back and forth. And they paid a large fee to have it done. But it actually was more, more economically uh, feasible for them to do that and pay that fee because of the fact it saved on selling time. And it saved on, on loss of revenue because they were not spending all that time in the water. It shortened the time that they would cross over to the east and to the west. And so Corinth became a very wealthy city. It also became a city that was so cosmopolitan that everything from around the world found its way to Greece. And if you really wanted to insult somebody's morals, you would say, you're nothing but a Corinthian. That's, that's, a, that's how low life they were. But into the city, Paul came, brought the gospel. There were those before, others before him, through some of the Paulus. They started, the church was there. Paul began preaching, ministering to them. And he's writing them concerning the need in the church in Jerusalem, the mother church. Because that area there was facing severe persecution, and Christians were being killed and up in prison, and others were being denied employment. So they were going to the aid of the mother church in Jerusalem. So he talks about this in the 8th chapter. He gives to us instructions and about this offering being collected for the headquarters church. And he talks about Titus and three other men who are men of character who are to take this to them. And when he talks about this word for offering in the text, the words that literally charis or grace. And he says in 1 Corinthians 8 and 19 that this is a glorious word or a charis or a grace gift. In other words, they're giving it out of their love. You see, giving to God must be done out of love. If you do it out of duty, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything. I mean, it blesses people, but it doesn't bless you. Because your attitude has to be, God, I realize that everything that I have comes from you. And I want to show my love but to others because I can help them. This morning, I prayed with that family. I gave them a Bible, a New Testament from the Gideons. And I, uh, and, and I gave them not only that, but I gave them the food that they needed from this church. You did that. You did that. We gave them the $5 food cards from, from a local restaurant here in town. And they got a dollar menu, and that's what I eat. So I figured they could enjoy it too. Uh, and, and, and so anyway, uh, we were looking at that. And, and next week when you get the, the February bulletin, I've got the insert there on the desk. You're going to get one of something like this, a little bit larger than this. But it basically is the missionaries and ministries of this church that we support. And, and you need to realize that we operate this church, but we also are give through this church. Because if God gives it to us and he can give it through us, he'll give it to us. Because if we're, if we're faithful little things, he'll make us faithful in much. So here in the state of California, we have what we call Antioch Connection. Our brothers and sister churches join together to help new works. We're planning churches. We get them going. 
We support the pastors. We support them having to rent a property until they can get on their feet. We also, if somebody, if a church gets into trouble and we have a, having a struggle, we can go to their aid. We, we bear one another's burdens, the Bible tells us that. We around the world are, are, are through your tithe and your offering. We're, we're, we're in the continents of the world. We're in Australia. We're in South America. We're in China, the Asia region. We're in Ecuador. We're in France and Germany. We're in uh, Haiti. We're in Central America. We're in the Middle East and Israel. We're in Nepal, where 99% of the people are, are Buddhist. And we're in the Philippines. And we're in the Ukraine, where our orphanage was shot, was blown, was blown up by the Russian artillery, the separatists in the Ukraine war. We didn't lose anybody. We got them out, but we had to relocate them. Uh, we're in Zambia, in Africa, general. In global, we're, we're around this place of training people around the world as chaplains to, to go into places to serve in the military. Uh, every December, we give what's called a Christ birthday offering. And that offering is given for disaster relief. A hurricane hits the Gulf. We're there. Something happens in South America. We're there. In Haiti, the earthquake. We were there. We were there. And, and, we, and we do that. And then in our own community, to the various places here uh, that we give, uh, the homeless shelter, the Crisis Pregnancy Center, Global uh, Gideons International, Salvation Army, Team Challenge, Youth for Christ, we're involved here. We're, we're working together because we're trying to do one thing, and that is to bring Jesus to people in ways that they can relate. God calls us. Somebody came to you because somebody gave so that they could come. And so the principle of sowing and reaping is in reference to farming analogies of the Old Testament, and you can read about them you know, if you want to see the scriptures, I can give them to you. But basically, it's the idea that a farmer puts seed in the ground, he waits, and the rain comes, and he waits for the harvest. He's not going to get it the next day. He put it in, he's not going to get it the next day. He goes out there and says, that's it, I give up farming. I put that seed in yesterday, that was good seed. I put water on it. There ain't anything there. It's worthless. I'm not going to do it. You see, oftentimes people think if I get them in return, then I'll give. And that's not the way it works. Sometimes God gives it to you quickly, but sometimes God gives it to you over time. But the harvest does come. God calls us because love and devotion is what we're talking about. And the sense we find this in Luke, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 4. It's Jesus. It says, Luke says that Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all these others. For they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Wow, you think about that. You talk about uh, true giving above all others, selfless giving. This is what the woman did. Nobody saw it. They could care less. Remember, they looked at it and said, why don't you keep that? We don't need that. That's just two little coins. You, see, you can't really do it with two little coins. Oh, but God can. I read the Bible where he did something with a cup of a few fish and a few pieces of bread. And he fed thousands. You see, that's what we're doing. We're trying to reach people. We're supposed to be witnessing out on the street. We're supposed to be witnessing our work. Richard mentioned about a, 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 an encounter with somebody that he worked that he worked with and been involved with for years and invited him to church. He knows his background is not ours. But still, did God give the opportunity to open the door? These are the moments, the God moments, that come to your life. Ask God to help you be alert to them. Sometimes I have to ask God for giving because I wasn't thinking and he catch it. That's okay, God will forgive. You see, the rich gave out of their abundance, but she gave sacrificially out of her poverty. And so the amount is not significant, rather the spirit in which it was given and, and, and the right spirit of giving is a worshipful, inevitable, inevitable outflow of love from the heart. When we give in the right spirit, it's worship. We worship God. It's inevitable. It's an inevitable outflow of love. We're given out of love. You see, nobody noticed what she did, but God did. That's what really counts. You know, some people like to people to praise them. You know, Jesus talked about the Pharisees doing that. But you know what? Nobody knows what she did. If they had looked at it, shook their head, said, why didn't you just keep it? But God knew. When we give to God, God knows. God knows. And tithing is what Jesus talked about. You know, some people say, well, you know, the Old Testament, but Jesus commanded in Luke 11, 42. He talked about the Pharisees. He said simply that, uh, that uh, you tithe on mint and ruin every kind of garden herb and you disregard justice and the love of God. 
But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You should tithe, but you should also do it in the right spirit. That's what he said. They were doing it out of, out of obligation, out of self-aggrandizement. You know, I, I want people to look at me. I'm so religious. I even, and I've thought about that. Cumin's a little seed. It's almost impossible to pick that little thing up. Can you see some Pharisee before he goes to the temple taking his, his harvest of cumin, laying it on the table, one for God, nine for me. One for God, nine for me. But they were so meticulous that they literally did that. Jesus said, that's not the point of tithing. It's out of your heart of love that you give so that you can help others, not to be seen of men. The Lord loves the cheerful giver, the one who gives. The word cheerful is from the word cars grace. The one who gives. The Lord loves the grace giver. See, tithing was observed in the Old Testament. The Pharisees obeyed, but Jesus said, you're not to stop tithing, but you're to do it for the right reason. In Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament that closes what's called the dark period between the Old and the New Testament, when, when vision, prophecy, and revelation stopped, as it were, until the coming of the message of the birth of Jesus Christ and the preaching of John the Baptist, Malachi gives a final word to these people who are going to go into a time when the, when the prophecy, the prophetic will end. He's trying to tell them to prepare them for their future. And it was a very tumultuous time when you read that 400 year, 40 year intertestament period of the geopolitical conflict that was going on in the world around there in their time. And Malachi is the final prophet of the Old Testament. And he talks about the burden or the oracle of God. The word oracle is a word we don't use anymore, but basically it means a message from God. That's what it means, the word of the Lord. The revival period of rebuilding the second temple of the past and the zeal of that generation had died with them. If you read in the Old Testament, you read about Ezra and Nehemiah going back to rebuild the temple. You read about, uh, about the opposition that came and false accusations and stopping the work, laying the foundation, can go no further. God moving upon Nehemiah to start building the walls so I can build the temple again. You read the prophet Haggai that says to them, you need to consider your ways because you've forgotten the temple of the Lord and the money's coming in to your banks, but you got holes in the bottom. So the money's dropping out as you go. You don't know where you spend it. And he said, you need to consider, rise and build the temple, build my house. That's what Haggai says. Zechariah, the prophet, prophesies about the governor, Zerubbabel, that he's going to build this temple in the face of opposition. And the Jehoshadak, who is the high priest, who is looked like it to a man who's filthy all over. And God says, clean him up and put the priestly robes on him. What he's saying is, I'm going to bring back my glory that's going to be greater than the glory that was here. And he's talking about his son coming to the temple. Rise and build for the future. Not for your present life, but for those who will come after you. Because support for God's work is generational. It's futuristic. It points us to the fact that our sons and our daughters, our children, our grandchildren, that they will grow and know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. I want you to see, I don't want to put them on the spot, but I'm not going to ask them to say anything. But sitting here in this service today is Willowdean Smith. Willowdean remembers when this church started as a tent and out there on Shafter Road. You remember that, Willowdean? Back years ago. You know who's sitting next to her? Her son, Bob. He was a kid back then. You know? Do you see what I'm saying? You see an actual event of what this church has been impacted by. Nobody I know of in this room here maybe has been out there. Has anybody else were out there in the early days? You just raise your hand. If you were out there, I don't know. Is there anybody else? Okay, okay, yeah, Eloise. That's right, Eloise is out there. I preached there. When I preached there, I never knew that one day I'd be pastoring that church here. I preached as a young preacher just starting out there, and I first got married. I rode a dirt bike out there on Shafter Road. I did a willy. <laughs> went over my head. Buried my face in the asphalt. That's why I look this way. I got an excuse. What's yours? But you see, that's that's where we started. This is where we're at. We did it for our kids, for our grandkids, for those who come after. Them. But it ended. They died. Now a Persian governor was ruling them. But he begins to talk to them about his jealous love for them. 
And then he reminds him, he corrects the priesthood. He, uh, he corrects the marriage disorder. He talks to him with a divine response to those who've given up and say, well, God's not going to do anything anymore. He used to, but not anymore. He gave a strong rebuke to them and said, you've forgotten about the tithe of the offering. And he talked to the doubters about the assurance of the faithful that God would come through. And he called them to recall the law and righteousness, the prophetic reproach that God must not finish with what has happened in the past. He's doing something now for the future. He said, know this, I'm going to send Elijah, the forerunner of the Messiah. He will come. And Jesus said, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He talks rhetorical questions. Will a man rob God? Yet you say, how we robbed you? You've not given your tithe and offering. He goes on, he talks about this. And, and he tells us that, uh, that, that God wants to do something and God is going to do something. He wants them to prepare not for their generation, but for the generations that are coming. You see, one of these days we're going to pass off the scene. One of these days, if the Lord tarries, we're going to die. And let us go on a cruise when it happens. <laughs> you're gonna, we're gonna come in. We're gonna have a funeral service, make the committal, and eat the potato salad. That's what we do at funerals. But what is we're talking about is legacy. Yes. The heritage of the Lord to our sons and our daughters that they might prophesy. And so it is, we look at this, and he says that to, to prove me, you know, he says, put me to the test. You know, the, the word there, that's the only place in the Bible where God says, test me. Test me, says the Lord. If I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out uh, a blessing that might be rude enough to receive it. He's talking about giving to God. He says, and I'll give back to you. You don't want to give God. And then he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will the vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, he'll keep you employed. Translation today, he'll keep you working. He'll make a way. If you lose a job, he'll open up a better job. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. And all the nations will call you blessed, and you should be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. You know when we give to God's work and people get saved, they bless us? Do you know that the Bible says that right here? That God is pleased with that? Listen to what it says here. That those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. God's listening to this service today. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. He keeps a record. It's a remembrance book. We may forget our conversation. We may forget in a few weeks this message. We may forget this interview. But God doesn't. Then he gives us this promise. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possessions. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son. Who serves him? See, the Old Testament, people say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, it's filled through the lens of the New Testament. You know what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? All Scripture, old and new, yes. is inspired by God. That word means the Holy Spirit breathed on it. And is profitable for the following things. For teaching us. We've got to be taught as Christians. We don't get saved and just sit on the sideline until, until the Lord comes back. We've got to be taught how to live a Christian life and how to share that Christian experience with others. So we're teaching. For reproof, the word means to say, hey, you know what? You messed up. Fess up, get up. Remember that? If you mess up, fess up, get up. And for correction, now don't do it again. This is why you don't do it. You turn from sin, you confess sin, you turn from sin, don't do it again. For training, you've got to be trained. You've got to be trained in righteousness. The word of God, that's why that I want you to read the Bible every day. That's why I want you to learn scripture so you'll know how to live. I can't run around and say to you, well, don't do that, but do this. You're supposed to grow. You're supposed to develop your, your relationship with God. You're supposed to read the scripture every day. And take a pen and a paper, write it down, or your journal, write it down. Or, or your notepad, if you're using an electronic, of questions you have and answers. Steve brought me a good question this morning, and I answered the question. Afterwards, we're able to talk about it, because that's what happens. We'll be glad to work with you on that. You're not in it by yourself. And don't let the devil give you this observation that makes you feel so inadequate. I hate to do it because I may look like I'm dumb asking that question. There's no such thing as a dumb question except the question that's not asked. That's the dumb question. If you don't know and you want to find out, ask the question. 
ask a question. And so we look at this, we find this, and we see this, that all scripture is given by God, it's profitable for righteousness, so the man of God may be adequate, equipped to every good work and word. We're good, uh, God has called us to every good work. God has called us to learn the value of stewardship because it carries over in the way we look at our priorities of life. When we put God first, some of your priorities are going to change because you're going to see that, they're, that, they're, that they don't make sense. They're illogical. This world is illogical. Heaven is logical. And some of the things you think you just got to have, you really realize when you got it, you wouldn't like it anyway. You know, the Lord learns, gives you the gift of contentment. In other words, Paul said, I've learned in Philippians chapter 4, in whatever condition of life, how to be content in Christ. So God, that's one of the great things about stewardship, is that God teaches us how to rely on Him and not on ourselves. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it goes right along with the greater part of that verse, where it, the, that chapter where it says, give the first fruits of your harvest to the Lord, the tenth. It says, trust the Lord with all your heart, <laughs> lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your way, not unto Him, He should correct your path. I don't want to be insulted this morning, but I'm including myself in this. But you know, we're not nearly as intelligent as we think we are. And we're not nearly as clever as we think we are. We need God's guidance. Wisdom comes with recognizing that our help comes from the Lord. And so we need to understand that. Let me give you a couple examples where we're going to pray. Example number one. Oswald J. Smith was a God, man, a minister of the gospel that God called to become a missionary. He felt the burden to go to missions. He felt the burden to go to Alaska among the indigenous native population and to bring the gospel, to live out in the wilderness area among them. And he liked to die. He didn't realize he had such a weak heart. And he made it back sick. And they got him back. And he was there. And he went to the doctor. It took him a long time to get his strength back. Well over a year. He was in such weak condition. The doctor looked at him and says, Reverend Smith, I've got to tell you something. You can't go back up there. You don't have the constitution to survive in that environment or any other environment because that, uh, that requires arduous labor. Your heart's in bad condition. He was broken hearted. A church that even a pastor came open in Toronto, Canada called the People's Church. It was about to close the stores. It was in the height of the Depression in the 30s. If you don't know where Ontario is, it's right across the river from Detroit. And it was all involved in the auto industry. And in the Depression, the auto industry collapsed. Tens of thousands were thrown out of work. We saw something similar to that in 2008 when the auto industry almost went under. But it was even worse back then. He went to that church, and the church was behind in its bills. They couldn't pay. Uh, they were about ready to have the heat turned off. The church was struggling. He took the church. The first thing he got up, they told him, the board told him how bad financially they were and how they needed God to answer prayer. That first Sunday, he felt impressed to preach on missions, and he preached on missions and took up a mission offer. The next Sunday, he did the same thing. The third Sunday, the fourth Sunday, the board came to him and says, said to him, in effect, what can... Said, Pastor, we, we need to we need to uh, preach on uh, supporting this local church too. And he said, I, I'm burdened because God has called me to preach on missions. They said, Well, you know that you have a missionary's heart, but will you consider that? And he preached again, and something miraculous began to start happening. As they began to give away, people who were out of work went back to work, and nobody else was working. And it wasn't just a few months till the church was completely caught up on its bills. The debt was paid. And they became the, known as the world's largest mission church. And Oswald J. Smith made this quote. Why should any man hear the gospel twice until every man has heard it once? How many times have we heard the gospel in these years? There are people who have. One more story. And bear with me just for a couple more minutes, please. If the Baptist beats you. You can just call it a fast. <laughs> I want to tell you another story, the story of this church. It started in a tent. GI issue. Out on Shafter Road in 1954. Because people were concerned about a Sunday school for their kids. No churches close by really. And they started this church. I preached in the old building out there. Back in the 60s, as I said, not even thinking I've ever pastored this church. Never thought about it. But then this church 
moved in and built that building over there. And it was a struggle, but they made it. Then they built the annex, and it was a struggle, but they made it. Then they built this building, and it was a struggle. A major struggle. I was in administrative work in Missouri as a youth director, state youth director. A year every, in 1985, I came out here on vacation and I felt impressed that God might be changing my ministry. So Glenn and I prayed about it and I went and talked to the superintendent here about if administrative work and youth work did not open up, I was interested in coming back. I felt a burden to come back west. I didn't have a specific place in mind, but I just felt a burden to come back. And I, and I would like to be considered. He took note of that. That summer of 85, I was getting ready to do youth camps. And as I was getting ready to do youth camps, I received a phone call in the midst of one camp to another camp from the youth superintendent out here. And he said, I have a church that's come open, and I'd like to put you in that church. And I said, well, I appreciate that, but I made a commitment to the next assembly at this, at this, uh, this state and my job. And when there's camps, he said, we can wait till the camps are over. I said, um, but I told him I would stay in the assembly. When I came back, they asked me, and I said, I would. And I said, i got to keep my word. He said, well, you don't understand. He said, this church is open now, but it may not be open next year. And he says, I don't know if you'll even come to California next year. It may not be anything open. And I said to him, J.D., I, I understand and I appreciate what you're saying, but I have to keep my word. So I'm going to put it in God's hands. If God wants me in California, he'll bring me to California. If he doesn't, then I'll, we'll go where God opens the door for us. He said, well, I just want to give you a chance, but said, I, I, I'm just very doubtful about the future. I said, I understand that. And I think that that we went on through that next year. We got ready. And 86 was the general conference year. In the summer of 86, camps were coming again. And so on a Sunday morning, we were getting ready to go to church. I wasn't speaking because we were going to start camps very quickly. And I was concentrating on that. So we decided to go to one of our churches that morning in town. <coughs> And before I was, I was getting ready, I was, had the TV on, listening to Lloyd John Ogilvie, who at that time was pastor of, of Hollywood Presbyterian, spirit-filled man of God. And he was preaching, and God began to start dealing with me, and I started crying. My wife came downstairs, and she said, what are you crying about? And I told her, I said, but I just heard that I want to be used of God, and she started crying. We joined hands in that basement, just her and I, and the girls were still upstairs. And we prayed for God to open the right door. Went to church that morning, said nothing to anybody, came home that afternoon. That evening we decided to go to a church closer to us. And uh, so we went there. When I went to the door, there was a man who was going to be speaking. I didn't know he was going to be speaking. An evangelist friend of the pastor. I, two years before, he had held a revival. I went one night during the revival. Met him for about five minutes after church. Just made some nice, I enjoyed your message. You know, nothing, nothing, just... Uh, just, just small talk, but you know, genuine that I didn't enjoy his message because he had the ability, he was like Jimmy Swagger, he could play and sing, and he had a beautiful voice and a great musician and preach. And he was there, and he had just called the night before he got into town and told Bevan that he was in town, he'd want to come be with him in church, and Bevan asked him to stay over and preach Sunday morning and Sunday night. So he agreed to do it. He preached that morning and then that night. I didn't know what he was there. He was sitting in the front row when I came in, and I said, the row behind him. We were sitting down, didn't talk. He just turned, looked at me, nodded his head, smiled, and I smiled back. And that's as far as he got. When the service time came for him to go up to preach, he made some open remarks, and he was going to sing a couple songs before he preached. He turned from the pulpit like this to go to the piano. He took a couple steps, stopped, came back, and looked at me and said, Brother Drew Director, I don't know, even know your name, but I want to tell you, while I was sitting here, God spoke to me. And he said, the prayer that you prayed has been heard. God is opening the door. The door has been opened. And it's being opened again. That door that had been opened and closed and opened again was his church. It was almost 30 years ago. Now when we came, it was no, no, I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody, but I was the fourth pastor in 13 months. There was a lot of 
disconnect, disconnect. Ray was here and Mary and, and Dolores are the only ones that were here at that time now. We were in a financial bind. They had built this church. They had an enormous debt on it. They were several thousand dollars behind in just utility bills and things like this. And when we first offered, he got up here. And I'm not saying this to do all now. What a great guy he is. It just would be obedient to the Lord. My wife and I agreed in prayer, even though we'd come out on a credit card, that this week, the first Sunday, I would not take a salary. I'd give it back to the church because the church had to pay bills. Ray knows about that. And when we got ready to look, I asked Linda, she had been a state secretary. She was in banking and all this. She knows books. I asked her to look at the books, and she came out, and she said, Bob, I found a $143 mission pledge that this church has not been paid. And she looked at me, and she says, we've got to pay that before we pay anything else. If, if we're going to have God's blessing, we've got to keep our covenant with God. So the very first check that we wrote out and Ray and I signed was to World Missions to pay that debt. And I want to tell you to know today that God, within six months, turned everything around in this church. People had a will to give. And miracle after miracle has brought us to this place. Now, I'm telling you that because I want you to know that the book of Malachi, the revival had come, but then the people had kind of looked at life and was going as usual. But now I want to tell you, the time for renewal is now. The time for revival is now. The time for breakthrough is now. We're not coming here to set. We're coming here to minister. It is the call of God in my heart, in my passion. It burns today brighter than it ever did. I haven't seen everything God promised me yet. But he will fulfill what he says in his word. So I'm telling you, I'm asking you, join with us in doing God's work in the kingdom of God. Nobody's going to check you. Nobody's going to treat you any different. We're going to love you. You're a part of this church. You're a vital part of this church. We need to pull together for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is coming again. If you don't read the signs in the word of God, it's there. When you see these things begin to happen, then look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. I tell you, Jesus is coming very, very soon. And I cry out, even so, come Lord Jesus. I want you to look at that chart up there. That blue up there says 10%. That's what tithe is. Look what you have left, 90%. You can use that and give it in offerings to help missionaries or however you want to spend it. Ask God for wisdom to spend it wisely. It's a small amount that God requires in our lives. But oh, you're blessed when you obey. Let's pray. Father, as I come before you,